Welcome back. And this this video is our next design workshop, and its main purpose is to give us an opportunity to really apply our skills, techniques that we've been developing for establishing proportions, proportional relationships between different different lengths and distances in our designs. And one place where I find that technique really pays, or these techniques really pay off, is when you're doing things like laying out bookshelves or chests of drawers that have graduated heights in them. Um, oftentimes a bookshelf will have shorter shelves, shorter shelf bays on the top than they do on the bottom, and there's a kind of a continuous progression of heights from top to bottom. And the same is, is true with uh, chests of drawers, like dressers or um, uh, large old campaign chests and things like that. So this is going to be a design workshop that is somewhat realistic because I've already designed and am planning to build some loft beds for my daughters. Um, they need better storage in their rooms, though. I know this because I, I find their clothes all over the floor a lot of the time, so they must not have enough room to put those clothes away, and um, the same with their books. So I think they're probably going to need some new and sturdier bookshelves and dressers that they can fit under these loft beds. And because of that location, because they're going to work together with these loft beds, that physical space that they have to fit into is what's going to steer most of the design criteria. So the design criteria for both of these pieces mostly revolve around the dimensions and the space that they're going to fit in. Both pieces have to fit under a five foot ceiling and that's because the underside of the loft bed that they're going to slide under is, is five feet high. Um, in either case, at least a little bit of room should be be left so that they can be slid in and out easily uh, whenever moves happen. But um, in the case of the, the dresser especially, it really shouldn't reach that maximum height. It should, it, it should allow for a fair amount of space, maybe even as much as a foot above it, uh, because if you think about the way a dresser works, there's, there's drawers on it. And if you pull a drawer out, the top drawer out on this dresser, it goes right up to the five foot ceiling, well, you're not gonna be able to reach in to the top of that top drawer. It's gonna be useless. So those are some height constraints that are put on by the bed itself. Likewise, uh, the maximum width that's available under this, this bed for these pieces to fit in is going to be about three foot four inches, but I'm not, planning to make either piece right at that width because then it would be difficult to again slide it in and out. On the piece, probably the dresser, that is under the loft bed on the end where the ladder is, I really don't want it reaching that full width of three foot four inches because it's going to interfere with the, the girl's ability to step on the rungs of the ladder, their toes are going to be blocked from going in all the way um, and getting a good step on each, each rung if there's a dresser right on the other side of it. So there's gonna be a need to leave a gap. The maximum depth of each piece really shouldn't exceed 18 inches in either case. Probably shouldn't be less than much less than 11 or 12 inches um, in either case either. I'm leaning towards shooting for a depth of around 18 inches for the dresser so that the drawers will have enough storage capacity in them. And with the bookshelf, uh, 
closer to 11 or 12 inches is probably fine. You start making bookshelves that are much deeper than that and your small little paperbacks just end up sliding all the way to the back of the shelf anyway and I don't really like that. I'm thinking I'd like to have about four shelves on the bookshelf and um, five drawer bays uh, vertically spaced on the, um, the dresser. And those I'm intending for both the drawers and the shelves, I'm intending to uh, scale the heights so that they're continuously proportional to each other from the top to the bottom in an increasing pattern. Uh, I'm just going to use solid paint grade wood for, for these, nothing super fancy, probably just a lightweight material like pine that will be easy to paint, easy to renew the finish when, you know, it gets beat on, um, you know, it's to kids' bedroom. So there's, there's really no need for anything fancy here. And, and then uh, there's going to be a spare aesthetic along those lines as well, because most of these, you know, for the most part, these pieces aren't going to be that visible under the, the loft. One's going to be tucked behind the ladder, the other one's going to be at the other end. The girls might see it if they're sitting down there in a chair, but it's not something that's going to jump out and be a, a showpiece of furniture that, that kind of commands the room. So um, it's, I think it's more important that it's easy to move in and out uh, from underneath the bed and it's um, durably constructed. With our design criteria set, and the fact that those design criteria have mostly to do with just the space that this bookshelf and later on the dresser have to fit into, we might as well jump ahead and pick the um, rational relationships, the proportions between the width, height, and depth for the bounding box that these pieces have to fit in. And we'll start with the bookcase and then move on and design it and then we'll revisit that same question for the dresser later on. And so if we fix the height as our primary critical dimension to be 59 inches, that leaves one inch of clearance under the ceiling which should be more than enough for the bookcase to slide in and out from underneath the bed without any real problems. Um, if I choose a width to height ratio of five to eight, then that's going to lead to a width that is approximately 37 inches, which more than fits into the 40 inch space that's allowed inside um, of, of the, uh, the cavity under the bed. The depth to width ratio, if I set that to be one to three, then that makes the depth right in the 12 inch range, which was in our allowable range and probably is a reasonable range for a bookcase. With those proportions set, then we might as well start laying a plan out for this bookshelf. And I'm going to begin by drawing a rectangle in which the sides are in a five to eight ratio to each other. So I'll do that as we've usually been doing. I'll draw a horizontal line, use a darker pencil maybe, but I can darken it later. And draw a vertical that is perpendicular to the horizontal. You know, I'm just going to set distances on these using my sector, set distances on these that are in a five to eight ratio, one another. So if I pick a distance somewhere on this horizontal line, in fact, we'll try the whole line itself. Make sure my compass didn't just spring, and it did, so I'm going to reset it carefully. Okay. Now I'm going to put that distance between the fives, because that's the width. And we've got a width to height ratio of five to eight that we're shooting for. 
Looks like I have to open this up quite a bit more. Okay, so my compass is set between the fives. I'm gonna reset it to the eights. See if I've got enough. I might have to extend that vertical line a little bit. We'll see. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to extend that vertical line just a little bit. So I'll go ahead and Let's take a straight edge and do that. This should give us room for a pretty good large scale design. The best straight line here. We can do better. Clumsy tonight. It's a little better looking at the line, and we'll mark where the eight step should end. Now, one other thing I'm going to do while I've got my sector still positioned is that I'm going to take another compass. I like to be able to draw scales on these designs. So I'm going to find the module that relates the width to height. By setting that compass to the one. And that means that I should be able to go, if I've done everything carefully, and I'll probably have to adjust a little bit from this vertical line, step out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it's not too bad. Let's see how, it's, it's a little short. I'm gonna probably end up adjusting it. Let's see about the width. One, two, three, four, five, and that's even closer. So I'm gonna spring the compass open just a little bit more and see if I can get both the width and the height to line up. One, two, three, or too much. Five. When I'm being careful, I still check my sector, the measurements I've taken from my sector by stepping them off of the compass and try to get everything to fit just right. Okay, so that lines up on the five pretty well. Six, seven. What I'm going to do is really trying to break stuff tonight. There we go. I'm going to clean up that line. What is that? Something sticky on my paper, that never helps. But anyway, clean up that line now. Okay, and then clean up this line.
I'm going to just get my sector out of the way for the moment. I'm going to go back and finish the rectangle. So I've got my layout square, my straight edge. Straight edge is just lined up with baseline. Now oh, I see part of my problem here is my layout square is not really long enough. All right. Or is my desk big enough to keep having to move stuff around? This is a T-square that I'm using, so that's why I'm not checking for a perpendicular line. My T-square is square, and my paper is anchored so that these lines are either parallel or perpendicular to the side of my desk. So, all right, there's a five to eight rectangle that's going to contain the front elevation view. Well, that's not good for squares. Like I said, I also like to draw some scales on these kinds of pictures. So I'm going to draw a couple of lines that I'm going to darken later that are parallel to the base. I'm going to use my layout square to uh, layout square that now has all kinds of junk from my shop floor on it, smudging everything with it. I'm just going to project the edges of this. This is all just sort of setup work. And it's probably too light to see at the moment, but what I'm doing is drawing some linear scales that we're going to be able to use to see the ratios and proportions that relate the different components vertically and horizontally on this figure. Also going to give us a place that we can set our compass to so that we get pick up different measurements um, to use repeatedly in our diagrams without having to reset the compass and do a trial and error stepping off of a distance or something like that. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and darken those so that you can actually see them. Just think about these as little rulers that appear on our page. And these are going to be what help us divide up vertical and horizontal spaces in a way that's kind of proportional. So the ends of these rulers are lined up with the either left and right or top and bottom edges of the bookcase.
And those are going to be places that, like I said, I'll, I'll leave a sign of the different divisions um, that I, I make for my drawing. So, I'd like for this bookshelf to have four shelves on it. That was one of my design criteria. And I'd like them to be spaced so that they are continuously proportional. A little more smudge up here. But the shelves themselves, as well as the walls of this case, are gonna have some thickness. Now, I'm probably just going to make this out of just dimensional three quarter inch thick stock from the, the home center. It's not gonna be made out of fancy wood, but I'm going to reinforce the front edges of this case with a face frame. And that will give it two things. It'll, it'll add some rigidity to the shelves so that they don't bow in the middle under the weight of heavy books. And it also allows me to change the apparent thickness of each shelf. It makes them look thicker, so I can choose that. And so I wanna take, I wanna start working out some dimensions that I can use for stuff like that. So I'm gonna take this module that I've already worked out that should step out one eighth of my height. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it did. And I'll go ahead and do this carefully, I guess. I'll take my sliding T-square here and draw lines through each of those pinholes that I just made with my compass so that we can see how this thing actually becomes a scale. I'm going to go kind of slow and methodical on this process because this is, since we weren't working too carefully with proportions and ratios, at least not in a very sophisticated way on the first design workshop. Um, I want to take our time and see how we can really make our plans do a good job of telling the story of how those proportions work together. All right. As far as the bottom scale goes, well, we should just step off five units. One, two, three, four, five. Um, pretty good. Let's kind of, yeah, it's still pretty good. All right, and then I'll just take my Layout square and mark those. Where my compass steps were. Okay. And that makes it pretty clear that we're dealing with a box that's in a three to five. Oh, box that's in a five to weight. 5 to 8 height to width ratio. Clean up some of my smudges. Oh, that hurts. Just raked my knuckle across the edge of this architect scale here and probably going to drip some blood on the, uh, the uh, picture tonight, but oh well. Okay, so I was saying before I started making my scale that I wanted to put a face frame on this. And I think what I've decided I'm going to try to do is go ahead and divide up one of these modules into four equal parts. I'm going to try to eyeball it and just step it off with this compass. That's too big. I can tell just by looking at it. One, two, three, 
or I'm almost there. Just open it up a hair. Let's try again. One, two, three. Still not quite there. So I opened it a little bit wider. Two, three. Yeah, that was it. Okay, so now I'm going to make those steps darker. One, two, three, four. All right. Now, same thing. I can take my, my um, T square here. I'm going to mark those divisions just because it's a little easier for you and me to see if I do. Okay, and so I've divided that top module into four pieces. In that setting, I'm going to use that as the width of most of the members of my face frame. So what the face frame is going to be is just going to be a border that goes around this frame, although I'm going to make the bottom part a little bit wider. And we'll probably gonna make it twice as wide. I'll just make it two of these steps instead of just one. But I need to lay that out. And since my compass is already set to one of these steps, I can always come back and reset it there if I need to, but since my compass is already set to one of those steps, I'm just gonna mark and pricks both on the top and side at top two corners and then just on the bottom on the bottom corner bottom edge on the bottom two corners and then along the there I'm going to take two steps vertically. And those are going to give me dots that I can connect with my pencil so that I can show where the face frame borders the entire case. All right, and so I'll start with a, uh, wow, I am bleeding. <laughs> How I sacrifice for geometry and design. Two fingers. <laughs> All right. Pulling a Roy Underhill in the shop tonight, bleeding on my work. All right, connect the horizontal pieces at the top and the bottom. I don't really like how that bottom one connected. I'm going to try do that just a little bit more carefully. Yeah, it looks better. All right. And then um, I'll just use this architect scale to line up the pinpricks that I made at the top and the bottom. And that lays out the border of the face frame. And it also gives me the remaining interior vertical space that I've got left to divide into four shelves. And that's almost true because on the front edge of each shelf, there's going to be a cross member of the face frame that spans from the left style to the right style. So if I've got three spaces that I want, or, or four spaces that I want to have, four shelf areas, that means I need to have three dividing shelves. And that means there's going to be three more of these quarter steps of a module that's left that I've got to take away from this interior space. 
Right, and I can maybe just step that down. One, two, three. And look, we can even temporarily, I'm gonna do this very lightly, but there's the mark I made. That should connect to the bottom of this first module because I've used up one quarter of that module for the top rail of the, the uh, face frame. And then here's two more pieces, or three more pieces that are quarter module high that I'm just taking them temporarily away from the distance from the top to the bottom because from this piece to this piece right here, that's going to be the remaining vertical space that I've got left in this picture to divide up into four pieces that are continuously proportional to one another. So that was one of the skills that we've picked up in this unit is how to take a segment, I'll go ahead and measure it now since I'm here, set your compass to the segment size go. And that, that, oops, lay my compass down so you can see. That's the distance that's left after I have the face frame edges on the three interior shelves. It's a space that I've got left to divide into four continuously proportional pieces. I'd like to make that division. I'd like to divide this distance up into four pieces that are continuously proportional in the ratio seven to six. And that's just, I, I like using that ratio with bookshelves. There's others that work fine as well. But I like using that ratio with bookshelves because it doesn't lead to that dramatic of a difference between the height of the top shelf and the height of the bottom shelf. But we'll go ahead and figure out what what that distance, what the shelf heights are once we've made these divisions. So, um, there's a lot of ways that we could do this height. What I would say we could do, knowing that we can I often do this on a separate piece of paper just to make my design a little bit neater. But I think today I'm just going to do my continuous, continuously proportional subdivision right here in place. Um, I'm just going to do it lightly. Ah, you know what? I don't want to do that. It's going to make a mess. It's a mess that I don't really want to have to clean up. So we'll quit while I'm ahead. And I'll just do this. I will draw. Again, I'll do it fairly lightly. I think I've got room to make this work. I'm going to draw a baseline. And on that baseline, I'm going to mark out the length of that segment that I'm wanting to divide up continuously proportionally. I am just pleading like a stuck pig on this finger. Get it to stop tonight. All right, so remember how we did this construction. We just took a line, any line, drew it at an angle from one edge of the segment. You know, I, I know I've got to draw that all a little darker than I, I have, or you're never gonna see it in this video. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll just grab this other pencil that's capable of 
giving us a dark enough line to see. You can always erase it, right? All right, now I'm gonna look for, here's a compass I can use, compass. And since I'm dividing into four shelves, I'm going to use the rule of thumb that my initial step size should be around a quarter, at least a quarter of the segment that I'm trying to divide. So let's see how I've got one, two, three, four, that's probably bigger than I need. I've got my step size, my initial segment that I'm going to expand that in this case, it's a little over a quarter of the segment that I'm trying to divide up into continuously proportional segments in the ratio of seven to six. So I'm going to mark that distance on my diagonal line. I'm going to go over to my sector and set that distance to the sixes. Open up the compass until I get to the sevens. And that is my new length. I'll go ahead and mark both of them. Just so we can see. Okay. Now, I'm going to open up the sector more so that this new setting will fit between the sixes. Open up the compass so that it will read the distance between the sevens. Copy that distance for here. Mark it so you all in YouTube land can see and open up the sector one more time so that that last distance will between the sixes and I'm going to read the distance between the sevens. Transfer it to my diagonal line. There we go. Alright. Sector out of the way. And I guess I've got a little bit more bookkeeping. I need to take my scale, I mean my layout square, project a perpendicular line up a little higher than that last mark, and it looks like that just makes it. Then what I'm going to do is take my larger compass. I hope this one's large enough. Yeah, it looks fine. Oh, finally bled on my design. That's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Found the intersection. So that I'm basically rotating this custom proportionally, continuously proportionally divided scale over to where it intersects my perpendicular. Now I can finally just use my compass to divide up the rest of that scale. Okay, so there's my steps. And bring my T square back. 
line it with the base of this segment that I'm ultimately trying to divide up. Project those intersections down. And I can even be careful and mark those intersections with an awl while I can see them. And I can locate them with a sharp pencil point. Okay, took a minute to do, but there are the subdivisions of this distance, which is just a copy of this distance, which is just the overall space between the top and bottom style of the face frame, minus enough space for three more styles to fit in the front of the three remaining shelves. And so here's how I can now use those distances. I'm going to work from the top to the bottom. I'm going to measure this opening, the first of my segments in the continuously proportional series. I'm going to transfer that distance from the top corner down the... I've been calling these top things styles. They're rails. Side pieces or styles. Sleep deprivation does not do wonders for the mind. Don't let it happen to you. All right, so I'm going to connect those marks that I've just made with a new rail. And then I'm going to take my small compass Verify that it is still set, and it appears not to be. I must have bumped it. I want it still to be set, there we go, to the rail width. And I'm going to transfer that width now so that I can draw in the rail for my top shelf. Okay, go ahead and mark that in. Then we just repeat the process. Take my compass that I've been using. That's there it is. Going to now measure the second segment in this continuously proportional series. Transfer it from the bottom edge of that rail that I just drew. I don't like using this ruler. I'm going to use this one to cut me. Okay, transfer those marks. Transfer the rail thickness so that I can draw the bottom edge of that rail. over. Now we're going to copy the third shelf bay opening. Here, just to save a little bit of time, I will copy the rail thickness at the same time, just so that I can draw a line, draw another line. All right, now if I've done everything right, should be able to copy this last segment length from the continuously proportional series that should be this. Oh, and I'm a little bit off, probably because I'm on camera and I'm moving sort of fast. But, that's okay. Because <clears throat> we're just trying to represent the relationship between the proportions in this picture. Um, and we'll be reconstructing them on a full-scale story stick whenever I get around to building this, this 
bookshelf from, for my daughters. So we can see that shelf heights, I'll write it in here. Shelf opening heights are continuously proportional in the ratio seven to six. All right, and that's about it for the front elevation view. What, the other thing that I, um, well, there's really two other things that we should do while we're working on this view. One is get some of the crud off of it. Um, I'm going to just draw in some vertical lines between these shelves that are somewhat representative of how I'd maybe construct the back. And the way the back is going to be constructed is it's just going to be um, a bunch of tongue and groove boards that span from the top to the bottom and then all the way around they are recessed in some sort of a, uh, a rabbit along the back edge. And um, generally when I make these things, they're just, um, it's whatever lumber I've got on hand, whatever widths they are, um, you know, there's no sense in wasting wood just to make a back that's gonna be hidden by books. So um, in this representation, maybe just divide, just to give it an, a sense of what it's gonna look like. We could just divide this space up into, well, we've already divided the horizontal space up into five equal pieces. So what I can do is take those marks along the scale, step them out across the top too. Open it up a little wider just to get them straight. Well, we don't even have to do that. We've got a sliding T-square and a layout square, so that's just not quite a reach. How frustrating. It'll get us close. So again, we're just trying to draw these lines in so that we give the illusion of a tongue and groove back. I'm not even going to draw them that dark. One of the things that I was going to do to finish up this front view of the, uh, the front elevation view of the, the bookcase was just to draw some vertical lines that are visible in the shelf bays themselves to represent some tongue and groove boards that would be uh, slipped together, fitting inside of a rabbit on the back edge, not the front edge that we're seeing now of this, this case, just to form the back of the, um, the bookcase. I just arbitrarily projected these one-fifth division lines up uh, through the the case itself but in reality um, those boards are going to be as wide as the boards that I have on hand when I get around to constructing the back on this. Uh, there's there's not a whole lot of sense in getting too carried away with trying to make the back boards fit together proportionally in a bookcase that's going to be hidden under a bed it's going to be full, filled with books so that you, you never see the back boards anyway. Uh, the other thing that I need to do 
is I need to take a one-third measurement of the width of this case so that I can get the depth of the case. And the way I'm going to do that is with my sector once more. And maybe I'll, I'll use my longer, more accurate pieces. So I'm going to go to my horizontal scale. Measure that width. Double check it. Okay, then I'm going to grab my sector. Open it up and set that distance. Now, one would be tempted to open it up and set that distance to the threes, but look what's going to happen. Because I'm trying to get a one-third measurement. I'm not even sure I can open this sector. Even if I open it all the way, I'm not sure I can stretch between the threes for this big of a measurement. But that doesn't mean that I can't get the distance that I want. It just means that I should work with something equivalent to a one to three ratio. So two to six would be fine if I could set the distance between the sixes. But I might as well make life a little bit easier on myself and pick this distance and set it to the nines. I could even have set it to the twelves if I wanted to. That would have worked. Because those numbers all are evenly divisible by three. And so now that I've got my sector set to nine, I've just got to take another measurement. It's one third of that between the threes. So the nines and the threes are the same relationship as setting the baseline on the three and the one-third measurement on the one. All right, so this distance, we can verify, should be one, two, three of the overall width, and it's just over. So again, I like to adjust. bit more still, not much, to adjust so that I can get it spot on stepping. One, two, three. That's pretty good. All right, so that measurement is my width. That's going to allow me to draw a side elevation view. And I'm gonna, this is why I often like to do my, my, subdivision constructions, my layout work, on a different piece of paper because then I don't have to erase everything. And I'm not going to waste your time erasing all of it. I'm just going to erase enough of it that it gives me some space to work. And boy, too bad that eraser doesn't erase blood. All right. That's good enough. All right, and I'm going to extend the baseline, the bottom of the bookshelf, over to the right here, and I'm going to take this compass that was one-third of the width and transfer it. There is my depth. And while we did a fairly long and detailed coverage of the layout of the front of this case, side elevation view and the top elevation view really aren't much more than drawing a couple of rectangles. That line is not going to be long enough, so I'll have to continue those on. Let's 
so that I can then clear my stuff out of the way. Bring my T-square up and project the top of the case onward. All right. So this is front ele or side elevation. You know, and I could attempt to get fancy and draw in where the face frame would be, and maybe even project those visible dimensions over, divisions, visible divisions over. There's a mouse that has run by my feet three times in the past couple minutes. And if it comes back again and I'm fast enough, well, it might be lights out for that mouse. All right. So that's all there really is to the side view. I can do same sort of thing for a top view if I wanted to. Plan view. Really just draw a line across. Give myself enough room here. I don't know that I have where I can project up the sides. Yeah, a little more room than that. Raw divider. There it is. Take my divider that had the depth measurement on it, transfer it to here and here. There we go. And same thing, I guess if I wanted to, I could sketch in what looks like the, where the face frame is. Just clean up my mess. Too much of it there to darken those lines again. I guess if I didn't already have an idea of how I was going to lay out the back on this this design, I I could do a reverse rear elevation view that showed some of those construction details, but I feel pretty co confident that it's going to be okay. Um, one other thing that I guess I should do, it's a good idea, since we've got sort of some mixed ratios here. I'm gonna draw my scale over here, just like I did underneath the front elevation view.
And then I'm going to draw an auxiliary. So I'm going to make a mark here. And, and maybe I'll get the T square again just to do this accurately. I'll just draw a secondary scale. Here we'll do this is just going to help us see the relationship between the front dimensions and the side dimensions, namely that the depth to width are in a one to three ratio. You'll sometimes see that on these designs is that there's more than one scale drawn along a particular dimension. All right. Yeah, it just neatens things up a little bit. All right. I'll just say there that depth to width is one to three. And that is probably enough to get to where you could start constructing a bookcase like this from, from these plans. Um, here's what we're going to do on the plans for the, um, for the dresser. So much of the process is going to be similar. So in the next few frames, what I'll do is go back and we'll talk about the design decisions that um, we've made for that dresser and how that impacts the ratios that are going to be at play, the proportions that are at play in, in its design. And then I'm just going to go ahead and design it off camera and um, we'll, we'll look and see how they impacted the, uh, you know, the the overall layout of the thing. It's going to be a pretty repetitive process to what we just did in detail here, so there's no need to, I think, watch me do that in real time. The dresser had a slightly different set of spatial criteria that it needed to satisfy. It still needs to have a width that's comparable to the bookcase so that it fits inside of the uh, cavity under the bed. Um, but the height really needs to be substantially less than the 60 inch ceiling. And that's because this is a dresser and it's going to have top drawers on it. And so if you had the dresser top go all the way up to the ceiling height of 60 inches under this loft bed, then when you open the drawer, there's gonna be no way that you can get up above that drawer and look into it and reach into it and get your socks out because the ceiling is going to be covering that. So we need to leave some headroom and I thought I'd leave about a foot of headroom uh, at the, from the top of the dresser, dresser to the um, um, underside of the ceiling made by the, the loft bed. So that means that the main critical dimension for this case is going to be 48 inches, four feet high instead of five. Um, and then the rational relationships between the width and height and the depth and width are fairly simple. I'm doing a uh, three to four width to height um, ratio and a one to two depth to width ratio.
all of that should make this dresser fit pretty well in this space under the bed. It's not going to fill this full front to back width, so there will still be room for the kids to stick their feet forward through those rungs and climb the ladder. Um, it's going to come about to this post that makes the right side of the ladder from, from the back. And then the top is going to stop about a foot short of the ceiling height under the, the bed. So that, like I said, when you open a drawer, you can still see what's in that drawer and take stuff out of it. So I'm going to now just go ahead and design this dresser off camera. I'll draw the picture um, so that it satisfies those ratios. I'll draw the design so that it satisfies those ratios that I just, just described. Um, I'm going to, instead of giving um, four shelf bays, like I did in the bookcase, I'm going to put five drawer bays from top to bottom. And that's just going to do two things. It's going to ultimately give me more useful storage um, because it's going to um, mean that none of the drawers are super, super deep where you'll just bury clothes in them that you'll never see again. Um, but it's also just going to look better. It'll look less clunky if I design it with five um, vertical divisions of drawers instead of, instead of four. And like I decided to do with the bookcase, I am going to um, I'm going to make those drawer heights continuously proportional. They're going to increase in height from top to bottom in a 6 to 5 ratio. So they're all going to be continuously proportional in the 6 to 5 ratio rather than 7 to 6. So they'll grow a little faster that way. It'll be a little bit more dramatic of a, of a growth rate from the top drawer to the bottom. Another difference that we'll see is that this particular dresser is not going to have a face frame per se. So we're not going to see any kind of a divider between the uh, drawer fronts on the top and the bottom. It's just going, they're going to be butted up against each other. So that actually simplifies the design a little bit, but I'll still have that vertical space that I need to break up into um, continue, five continuously proportional segments. Well, this is, um, this is how the design of the dresser, front elevation view and side elevation view anyway, turned out. Top elevation view is just going to be another, or top plan view is just going to be another rectangle. So I didn't bother to draw that. Much of this really would have been a repeat of the previous design process that you saw for the bookcase. I started by laying out a rectangle for the front elevation view and the, the um, width to height ratio, width to height ratio of that rectangle was, was um, three to four. The, so we can see the divisions, one, two, three, four high, one, two, three wide. So one module was this quarter of the height. Now I did end up putting a face frame around the perimeter of the drawer bays. I just didn't use dividers in between the drawers themselves. So the width of the face frame top rail and two side styles is one sixth of this single module. And the width or I guess height of the um, the bottom rail is just one quarter of this one module. So that left me with a remaining vertical space from here all the way down the, to here to fill with drawer fronts. And so those heights of the drawer fronts are continuously proportional in a 6 to 5 ratio, and there are five of them. The top one was going to get a little bit shallow, so I 
um, divided that in half across its width to turn it into two drawers. Now, we might ask, how tall are some of these drawer heights? We can we could calculate them precisely if we wanted to, but let's just try to get some semblance of an idea here. This top drawer front, if I just measure it with a compass, and I remember that this vertical module is one quarter of the overall height. Overall height is 48 inches or four feet. So these vertical modules are just one foot. And that first drawer height looks like it is about three sixths of one foot or half of a foot. So this top drawer is going to have a front that is six inches high. So those, those drawers have a top to bottom depth of a little under six inches because of the way they're going to be constructed behind that front. So that's a good sized drawer for incidentals like your socks or your spare change and stuff that you just carry around during the day. This bottom drawer, let's see what they range to, because we wouldn't want it to be too deep. So if I measure it and compare that to one of these scales, well that's just under a foot. So it's kind of a deep drawer, but um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you could store bulky things like maybe some sweaters or sweatshirts. Um, so it's nice to have at least one of those. So over this course of st stepping from the top down to the bottom, the drawer heights gradually almost double from about six inches to a little under 12 inches. Um, and, I, and I'm okay with that. I think if you wanted to, it's always worth experimenting with two different parameters when you're trying to work out a division scheme like this. And those are going to be the number of drawers that you divide the space up into from top to bottom. And also the, um, the, uh, the growth factor, the, the ratio that you use for the continuous proportionality between all the drawer heights. So six to five is a kind of rapid growth. If I had done something like seven to six, then um, these drawer heights would have been a little bit more evenly spaced. This one wouldn't have ended up quite as tall. This one wouldn't have ended up quite as short. But um, I think I'm okay with the way that they're, they are for the purposes of my daughter's dresser. Um, and we'll probably proceed from you know, from here. So this this design is basically done. What I will say though is that there's still room for refinement because now we're more or less at the end of this um, design workshop and we're also at the end of what we're going to look at for designs that are made up solely of rectilinear, rectilineal figures. Um, meaning straight lines and angles. In our next unit, we're going to start learning how to introduce curves into our designs. And a piece like this would be an ideal candidate to throw some subtle uh, but small curved features into it. We could have a molding that has a curved profile across its cross section that travels along the bottom and the top edge of this to give it a little bit more visual interest and appeal. Um, there could be a little bit of a cutaway on the bottom that's a curve that just makes the whole unit a little bit more stable so that it's setting on four corners rather than a long base edge. So we'll look at some of those kinds of possibilities in our next unit. Uh, but for now, it's time for you to try to develop your own take on a bookcase and a dresser and see what kinds of design criteria you come up with to cause it to make your meet your needs and then see what your resulting designs look like. Thanks for watching.